Martin, um, to, to all of you. Um, um, I'll be talking to you today about some really um, neat work I've been doing with uh, another climate health working group with uh, Cochrane, which used to be known as the Cochrane Collaboration. Oops, and how do I advance? There we go. So um, what I'll do today is I'll give you, um, I assume since you're here that, uh, that you're aware that climate change affects health and know a bit about that, but I'll go over the, a few basics just in case. I'll talk about um, some of the challenges of producing relevant health research. Talk then a bit about Cochrane um, and the development of our climate health working group. And then I'll tell you um, about some of the projects we're doing. So I will be covering a lot of points for you in this. And um, so uh, I thought I would start with my ending point. Um, this is, um, these, are, these are some of the points I'll be um, concluding on and, and mentioning through, the, uh, through my presentation. So health research skills can be useful and relevant um, for addressing the impacts of climate change. Um, and you don't have to be a climate change expert to make a contribution. Uh, there are resources available for you for what you need to learn and colleagues you can work with. Um, and the key point that, um, that's important to remember and that I will touch on here and there is the future will look nothing like the present. Uh, and this has implications for um, our adaptation to climate change in general, um, but has implications for um, health research and health research methods. So this is me. Um, I live and work in Edmonton, um, and it's my great privilege to be able to uh, travel and play on lands that have been uh, occupied for thousands of years by uh, many, many um, different groups. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. And, um, <clears throat> and, <clears throat> my, and my time on these lands is part of my, um, pardon me, part of my commitment to uh, thinking about climate change at this point in my life. With me in this picture is my daughter. And uh, I remember when I was pregnant with her, she's now 20, um, amazingly enough, um, being worried about the, the world that I was, that she was coming into and what would be waiting for her. So I've been concerned about climate change for a really long time. I mean, I, I've I was thinking about climate change before I became pregnant too, but I, but I remember those, those nights of wondering what, uh, what her world would be like. But for a long time, I didn't feel like I really had a role to play um, with the climate crisis because I saw climate change in terms of um, things that I didn't really know anything about. So like polar bears or uh, carbon taxes and glaciers, um, or this uh, charming little guy in the, in the lower corner, I would see the impact of the pine beetles in our time in the mountains. Um, but, um, but yeah, didn't, didn't see myself as really having a role in, in, uh, in responding to climate change. And then uh, a few years ago, the Yale School of Public Health in the US launched um, uh, an online certificate on climate change and health. And I don't remember how I found out about the certificate, but I remember my, um, uh, the sort of shock that went through me um, of like, I didn't know that climate change was a health issue. And so I signed up for the certificate. Um, I was in the first cohort that ran, I think three years ago, four, four years ago, whatever it was. Um, and a few weeks into the certificate program, I realized that thinking about climate change and health was the work that I would be doing for probably the rest of my life. And shortly after that started um, the wheels in motion to start my PhD in this area. Um, but I'm not gonna be talking about my PhD work today. I'll, I'll be talking about um, um, another, another stream of work I'm doing. So like I said, you guys probably know about climate change and health, but it never hurts to go over um, the basics. So this neat little slide was produced by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the US. In the center, we see the driving forces of more extreme weather, rising temperatures, increasing um, uh, carbon dioxide levels and rising sea levels. Um, and from 
radiating out from that various impacts and beyond that, um, a wide range of health impacts. Um, so to go into a little more detail, we see that the climate change is creating changing weather patterns. Um, you know, this is winter for uh, those in the Northern hemisphere and you've probably gotten used to the last, you know, your last few winters have been a little weirder than what we might remember from 10 or 20 years ago. Those changing weather patterns are shifting the geographic range and the seasonality intensity of transmission of some climate sensitive infectious diseases. We're also seeing an increase in morbidity and mortality associated with extreme weather and climate events. We're continuing to learn or gather more evidence about the size, timing and distribution of the burden of disease and injury related to climate change. Um, as climate change intensifies, we're getting more evidence. Um, and a crucial point is none of the health impacts of climate change are new and we know how to manage them. Uh, the challenge is ensuring that climate change is explicitly and appropriately considered in health policies and programs. And I've bolded that point because that um, necessity of considering um, climate change risks and impacts is, um, is a key driver for the work of, of the group I'll be telling you about today. Yeah, so it, oh, if, um, if you're not asking a question, if you could just make sure you're muted, that would be great. I think a, a couple of you have your mics on. Um, so let me tell you a bit about Cochrane. Cochrane is um, an international organization that's been around for about 25 years. Um, it's largely volunteer driven um, and spans um, many countries around the world. The driving force in Cochrane is um, a desire to improve uh, global health um, by, by producing resources for decision makers um, that synthesize health research evidence. So um, there's a huge amount of um, research published all the time. And uh, it's really tough for people making, um, you know, health professionals or health policymakers to keep up with all of that. Um, so Cochrane has come about, um, is driven by, um, like I said, largely volunteers with some paid staff to, um, to produce summaries of research that can help decision making. So you can read one thing rather than 20. Um, so I've been involved with Cochrane um, in a variety of roles uh, since 2004. Uh, and I love, this is a organization very dear to my heart because of the people that are in it. So I mentioned um, syntheses of research. Um, the most common type of synthesis that the folks involved with Cochrane produce are called systematic reviews. And you're probably familiar with that, but maybe you're not. So I'll tell you a little bit about what those are. So a systematic review um, attempts to identify, appraise, and synthesize all of the empirical evidence that meets pre-specified eligibility criteria that answers a specific research question. So uh, there's a lot of syllables there. So what it means is, say you have a question like, I'm a pediatrician and I'm worried about, interested in drug A versus drug B for treating fever in children. So that's my question. Um, I would go out and gather all of the studies that um, relate to that and pull them together using, often using statistical methods. And the point of that is to support practice and policy decisions. Um, so like I said, the idea is then you can read this one review rather than yourself having to go out and uh, uh, read 15, 20, 40 studies on this, this one issue. Um, the people doing these systematic reviews use um, very explicit, um, well-studied methods. Um, and the point of this is producing the most reliable findings possible. Again, to inform decision-making, it always comes back to that. But um, um, the, the research methods that are adequate and really well suited for drug A versus drug B for a fever in children 
um, aren't don't work as well for research questions um, related to um, the health impacts of climate change. And so Jan Minx, Neil Hadaway, and Chris Ebine, um, who are all very um, brilliant, thoughtful people in this working in, in this space, published uh, a really challenging, provocative article in Lancet Planetary Health in 2019. And um, challenging the um, health uh, research community on the one hand and the environmental research community on the other to start talking to each other more and learn from each other. They, they pointed out each field really has great strengths, um, but also um, some weaknesses on each side that could be remedied by connecting with each other. And some of the challenges that they uh, outlined for the folks working in health evidence synthesis, um, I'll go over now briefly. They um, point out that um, those of us in Cochrane and other systematic review producers, we've hysterically taken a narrow and disciplinary focused approach. Um, and that's been excellent for the type of work we've been doing. But for the grand challenge of securing human and planetary health, we need to, to move outside that. Um, a key question around um, climate change and responding to climate change um, you saw, you, you, you remember me mentioning at the outset that the future will look nothing like the present. Um, how do we evaluate alternative futures? Um, there isn't one trajectory that's locked in for us. Um, a lot of the alternative futures hinge on choices that we make right now around reducing or not reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and uh, so, there's um, in, in policy making and trying to look forward 10, 20, 30 years for making choices, um, there's a wide range of possibilities out there um, and which uh, um, Minx et al. have um, discussed with this, talking about deep uncertainty on how certain outcomes will unfold in a particular time or space. The policy problems, um, related to um, the health of human and natural systems are wicked problems. Um, they're very difficult to address, very highly complex, and they raise broader questions, very broad questions that don't follow that logic I was describing earlier of one intervention versus another. And so folks in health need to get a lot better at integrating multiple lines of evidence from different disciplines. So Dr. Christy Ebai, who's one of the um, uh, authors on this article, um, I'm lucky enough to have on my PhD committee. And she told me once, um, you know, one of the most important things she has to know in her work is who to connect with, who to pick up the phone and call. Like as expert as she is, she still has to work across multiple disciplines in the work that she does. Um, and a point, um, in the in some of the health related health work that's been done to date uh, related to climate change is um, that some of the health researchers doing this work are showing a limited understanding of the science of weather and climate um, and a lack of precision around the differences between weather climate and climate change um, and those are important uh, differences and and uh, highlight that folks in health need to be talking to folks in meteorology or um, geography or so on, the, the people who have made these types of things their life's work. So um, the Cochrane Climate Health Working Group, um, I'll talk a little bit about that now. The reason in the upper left-hand corner of your screen you're seeing Cochrane Complementary Medicine is because um, the part of Cochrane that deals with complementary medicine is lending us some web space. For the, for the moment. So the, um, this working group came, has grown over the last, I guess, two years, because it was about this time in 2020, I was looking ahead to Cochrane's annual conference, which as far as I knew at that point, was going to happen in October, 2020 in Toronto. And I contacted some of my colleagues and said, wouldn't it be neat to do a workshop on climate change and health and how Cochrane could respond to that. Um, 
And so um, a lot of enthusiasm cropped up right away. Like I said, um, the folks in Cochrane are very passionate. They love to um, get involved in global health issues. What I found when I started talking to my friends and colleagues was that a lot of them felt like they'd just been waiting for someone to ask them to get involved in climate change. Like I, so many of these people I was connecting with were, had, were really concerned about climate change for themselves and their children, but hadn't had really a way into that discussion yet. Um, and, um, you know, again, with that being with that health background, haven't quite found the, the health link. So we started with a, a small group, probably 15 or so people working on an abstract for the conference. Um, unfortunately, uh, unsurprisingly, the conference itself um, was postponed because of COVID, but the, the, group, the work of the group continued. And we now, um, without much um, recruitment uh, efforts, have grown um, to over 110 folks from a lot of different countries around the world. I mean, obviously, we still have a long ways to go in, in a global, becoming truly global. Um, but considering that there hasn't been a lot of, um, I haven't done a lot of work in recruitment, this is still pretty amazing. Um, and the people in it, um, you know, I've, are, the people in it are really great. I, I really love this group. Um, I've uh, coordinated a lot of collaborative research projects in my in my time, um, I have I've never worked with um, people who are so um, enthusiastic and full of ideas and really um, with tremendous follow through. Um, so, and I'll I'll talk about that more when I start talking about the projects we're doing. Um, but this just highlights again how how concerned so many people are about climate change and how excited they are about here's a chance to apply the very specialized health research skills that I have spent years or decades acquiring. Here's my chance. Um, so uh, I just um, as depressing as climate change itself is, um, my work with this group has been um, just a real real joy in the last couple of years. Um, and I come off calls for their different projects, feeling very excited. Um, oops, sorry, there we go. So the point, um, the point of producing, I'm just trying to circle back to a point I've made a couple times yet about the importance of decision making being supported by evidence. And here, Leah Barang Ford and some colleagues wrote an editorial. Um, for the Campbell Collaboration, uh, which is an organization doing evidence syntheses on uh, various social science topics. Um, and this, this sentence just sums up so much so well. There is no time left for trial and error. Um, you know, those of us working in the climate space know that really we're, we're the time is, is getting very tight for an effective response. Resources for organizing the transformation we need into a carbon neutral world are limited. And therefore decision-making on climate solutions needs to be based on the best available evidence. And this is the role um, that synthesis organizations such as, um, such as Cochrane and Campbell can play is, um, is helping to make that evidence available. So I'll, now I'll talk a bit about um, some of the projects that our group has been doing. So, oops, okay. So we've um, written about 18 of us got together to write an editorial for the Cochrane Library. This was fun, um, uh, coordinating a, a manuscript with 18 opinionated authors is, um, uh, was fun. And I, and I mean that, I'm not being sarcastic. Um, it was occasionally a bit overwhelming since I was the one coordinating the input. Um, but the, uh, the, the range of perspectives that, uh, that were integrated was, was a really neat project for me and I learned a lot. Um, our recommendations for Cochrane um, are these five points here. Um, the editorial itself should be appearing in the next week or two weeks 
on the Cochrane Library. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and what we're doing is challenging Cochrane in these five areas around supporting identification and prioritized of important questions uh, that uh, for synthesis, um, working with stakeholders to produce new reviews addressing key questions. Uh, and that bit about working in conjunction with stakeholders is really, really important. Um, that's part of producing syntheses that are relevant for what decision makers need, um, is making sure that you're starting with the right question. We need to evaluate new methods um, and support their use, like their development, their implementation where appropriate. Supporting the engagement of diverse and vulnerable communities at all levels is crucial. Um, the, some of the most um, heaviest impacts of climate change are following, falling on the um, most vulnerable communities around the world. Um, and often those communities are underrepresented in research. So we need to make sure that, that their voices are being incorporated. And lastly, working with other organizations, um, which harkens back to the point I was making earlier about health research folks needing to um, learn more about collaborating with people in other disciplines. Um, okay, so then um, our next project, um, we are doing, uh, we're working on a plan for a, um, looking at the contextual factors that affect climate health policy making. So we, um, this group, uh, which is about 20 people, from uh, various countries has come together. We've worked really hard on the protocol for this um, and come up with this question around what is known about the context um, for the development and implementation of climate health adaptation policy by health systems at national and subnational levels. Um, so it's, uh, it's a big topic. Um, and so we're going to use a specific type of um, method, which uh, scoping review, which is a method that's been um, developed for pulling together um, a, a wide range of different lit, uh, literature types on broad and complex topics. Um, and we're excited about this because not only will the um, review itself be really helpful, no one has done this type of um, work yet, at least not that we've been able to find, um, but it will be really helpful for our, our climate health working group to have a better sense of, of policymakers needs. Okay, so uh, another project we're working on, we've just started, um, is looking at um, the impact of climate change on uh, older adults. So what you see here is just a screenshot of some of the um, uh, a few articles um, that have been published on um, older adults and their vulnerabilities to climate change. And on the right hand side, you see the cover of a report that has just come out from the World Health Organization, uh, reflecting on the UN decade of healthy aging through the perspective of climate change. Um, I mentioned earlier about how um, impacts fall disproportionately, impacts of climate change fall disproportionately on, the, on vulnerable populations. Older people, older adults um, in many places are among the vulnerable, both because of, of physiological reasons, such as just frailty, uh, increased sensitivity to heat, um, but often those, but those too who live in poverty um, or who um, are dependent on others for care, such as community or long-term care, face higher um, climate change impacts. What our group has been doing, um, the group of this is we're working on a piece for the gerontologist, uh, which is a journal focused on gerontology, unsurprisingly. And um, we want to um, summarize some of the, the key points in the literature around the, the um, risks of, of climate change for the health of older adults. Um, and this has been interesting project for me personally, because I've spent most of my research life in child health. Um, and of course, children are also vulnerable to climate change um, as well um, for 
for a, a variety of reasons. And so coming into this work on older people, I was kind of, it has taught me a lot because I've moved from um, really thinking a lot about kids and their sensitivities to climate change and thinking across this entire life course. Um, and just, and a point that's come up as, as our group has, has talked about this life course work is um, again, getting back to what I, what I mentioned about the future, um, looking nothing like the present. Um, already in the present, we see older people being vulnerable to climate change in very concrete ways. Um, my dad is in long-term care in, um, in the lower mainland of British Columbia. And so uh, last summer with the, with the heat dome in BC, I was deeply worried about him with uh, you know being in a in a facility without air conditioning in unprecedented heat, fortunately he was okay. But um, that certainly brought home to me his vulnerability um, as someone with with multiple frailties um, uh, and very dependent on the the facility the safety of the facility he's living in. Um, so and and a lot of long term care facilities across the country don't don't have air conditioning. So that's a, a, an immediate problem. But as we see climate changing, climate change intensifying, um, what we will see for older people is more and more an accumulation of environmental challenges to their health throughout their life. Um, so um, it, it's, you know, and, and there's broader threats as well to the well-being of older people. And, which was brought up by uh, one of our members in terms of the members of the group working on this piece. I mean, as a health economist and pointed out that um, in some countries, uh, pension funds may be vulnerable um, because of the, uh, the impacts of climate change on financial markets. So, um, so there's, there's a lot of complexity um, to, to looking at uh, health and well-being through the, the perspective of, of a specific population. So this has been a really neat, again, a really interesting project to work on and a very committed team. Um, one, another project we're doing. Um, so you heard me talk about um, uh, the evidence syntheses and how they bring together a lot of different types of um, studies into one place. But obviously the strength of your synthesis um, rests a lot on how well you, you were able to find relevant work. Um, and so on a team with, um, when you're doing a synthesis, you bring in a trained information specialist, typically a master's or PhD uh, level trained person in information science who puts together a very elaborate search strategy for studies. Um, in doing some of my early work for my PhD um, around climate change and reaching out to information specialists, I found even people very experienced in doing search strategies in health um, found dealing with climate change really tricky because climate change is not a thing. <laughs> it's the 21st century, really. It's so broad. Um, and where do you draw limits in your search so that you're not getting 20,000 hits that you have to screen for, a, for an evidence synthesis. Um, so in talking to some of the information specialists in our working group, we felt that um, developing some search filters would be really helpful. Um, so uh, search filters are pre-written search strategies designed to retrieve a particular type of record. So in this case, um, records relevant to climate change. Um, and um, designed not just for medical data, medical or health databases, but broader, uh, like into other disciplines, I mean. Um, and the, the importance of this is that if you have an inadequate search strategy, you might be missing um, studies that you need for your synthesis. So this group, um, which is um, six uh, people, we meet every two weeks and um, and uh, have homework in between. So we're moving along very efficiently. We're working on developing search filters for some of the common pathways by which climate change um, affects health. And this will help future teams because their information specialist doesn't have to figure out the basics of climate change from scratch if they haven't um, 
dealt with climate change previously. So this is our last top uh, project. Um, so remember, this is a group of volunteers. We're, um, and uh, so this is, um, you know, the, the range of projects that are moving along are, are pretty amazing. This last project is a little different in that um, money is attached to it. Um, so this is a project uh, being run by the Office of National Statistics in the National Health Service in the UK. They um, got uh, five million pounds from the Wellcome Trust of which um, a certain amount is coming to our group uh, for a three-year project developing standards and models for describing the interaction of climate and health in global, offic global official statistics. Um, and this is a really, uh, I was rereading the um, um, project, uh, uh, the grant application last night preparing for this talk. This is a very complex um, project and I, I, I can't do it justice. I'm just starting to get my, my feet wet with it. Uh, so I can tell you a little bit about it, um, but I'd be able to, I'll be able to tell you a lot more in six months or so when we're, um, when we're, when we've gotten going. So there's, there's three main um, objectives here. Um, so uh, developing a framework for official statistics on climate change, environmental and health that is transparent and globally generalizable. So although the work's being led out of the UK, um, they will be, um, the project team will be forming connections with um, uh, government uh, decision makers in some low and middle income countries to test the framework as it's being developed to make sure it's not just something that will only work in the UK or uh, you know, equivalent uh, or countries with equivalent affluence. So um, as part of that, we'll be, um, the group will be developing a global reporting and knowledge sharing platform and an open source tool set with the goal of facilitating high quality research and official statistics in line with the agreed framework. And you might think, well, why does that matter? But part of the, some of the challenges with um, uh, assessing, I guess, climate change and health across the country is, uh, across the world, I mean, is the lack of consistency um, between countries on what's recorded and how it's recorded and how it's presented and, and so on and so forth. If you've, if you've tangled it all with um, um, trying to do data work across Canadian provinces and territories, you'll have had a taste of that, um, how challenging that lack of consistency can be. Um, and then uh, the third objective is looking at statistical methods to better estimate climate related health risk. So remember, um, you know, the future will look nothing like the present. So we need methods that can, can tangle with that, um, with trying to figure out climate related health risks in a world that's so uncertain. Um, so they'll be using real world data sources, including novel and big data um, um, and modeling local impacts. Um, and that modeling around local impacts is really important um, because ad a lot of adaptation policy is made at a local level, um, adapting to climate change. I mean, a lot of the policy is made at a local level, but those decision makers don't always have um, data that's at the scale that they need. Um, oh, pardon me. <clears throat> so um, the contribution of our group is we will be um, supporting the systematic and reliable review of the evidence used in the project. So deploying the um, fantastic skills that the people in Cochrane have, have, have. Um, and we'll also be helping um, with knowledge translation of the outputs. So developing um, products that um, can go to policymakers around the, the world and um, that explain the project properly, the findings and um, and how people, uh, how other countries can become involved over time. So, uh, like I said, I don't know a lot about this project yet. I'm, I'm very excited, um, more than a little intimidated, um, but very excited to, to be doing this work, and, um, and so excited again to be feeding into something that is uh, a project that's being designed by policymakers for use by policymakers that will have direct impact into policy making because that is 
um, if you haven't guessed it yet, um, a passion of mine. So that's been me talking for a long time, it feels like. Um, but um, here I am circling back to what I uh, told you at the outset that I would tell you. So health research skills can be useful in addressing the impacts of climate change. Um, you don't have to be a pine beetle expert to become involved in this conversation. Um, you don't have to be a climate change expert to make a contribution, um, but you do have to learn stuff um, um, and sharpen up your, uh, your skills at working collaboratively uh, with other disciplines. Um, fortunately, there are resources available for what you need to learn and colleagues you can work with. Um, and you, you've probably noticed my email address and uh, Twitter handle have been on, on almost every slide. And that's a hint that you can get in touch with me at any point. Um, and remember that we're moving into, into uh, interesting times. The future will look nothing like the present and, uh, and we need to um, have as many people as possible involved in, in that responding to that challenge. So this is my email uh, again, um, the short uh, version. Uh, I saw Mariah put a, a link to our climate group in the, in the chat a while ago. Thanks, Mariah. Um, there's a short version of that URL is here, climate.cochrane.org, if you want to have a look at our, um, at our small but mighty website, um, my Twitter handle there. And um, with that, I'm going to have a drink of tea and uh, hope that some of you have some questions. Great. Well, thank you very much, Denise. That was really fantastic. I know that I have several questions, <laughs> but I'm very impressed though with the comprehensiveness of uh, and the simplicity of your presentation. It just uh, pulled it all together very nicely and gives us a, a little bit of hope uh, in terms of what we can expect in the future to be able to guide us and to uh, mobilize us as, as we go forward. So are there any questions? I see a couple of people have raised their hands. So. Uh, Donald Sutherland, go ahead. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm interested in, thank you very much, Denise, for that presentation. And I'm interested in um, a group you called users. Um, I had the experience of working in the federal government in Canada and um, well, producing, of course, data and analysis and modeling and a lot of things. Um, but it was very difficult to get what I thought were some of the users to pay attention. So I'm wondering what your experience <clears throat> is with um, seeing what, let's say policymakers or decision makers, whether they be um, in the government or political parties or World Bank or something like that, what kind of questions are they asking in terms of wanting evidence about things? So I'll stop. Oh. <laughs> Gosh, um, that's that's a that's a big big question. Um, so let me let me think of a of a good way into that. Um, so I think, yeah, certainly, like I, a lot of my career, especially in in recent years, concerned with with questions of knowledge translation and getting people to to um, getting folks making decisions. Um, of aware of evidence and able to use it. Um, and it's, but it's kind of a two-sided thing too, in terms of making sure that um, the, the evidence that is there is, is actually usable. Um, so to take a small non-climate example, um, I used to work in, in trying to get um, pediatricians and pediatric health policymakers to use Cochrane reviews more, and often they would say, well, this review isn't relevant to me. It's not framed the way I need it to be. So Cochrane as an organization has done a lot of work lately to try and make sure that its reviews are framed with you know, stakeholder involvement to make sure that the, the right questions are being asked. Um, to get back to our, our climate group, a lot of the discussions we've had as a group is we need to know more about the questions that people making policy need answers to. And we need to know, like, some of those questions could be answered using methods Cochrane already has. Um, in some cases, we need to develop new methods. Um, so we've got a whole 
you know, if we, in, in a, with an infinity of resources and time, we, you know, we could have, there's a great research agenda there too. Um, but part of what we want to be doing is for the group and through that um, scoping review I mentioned, looking at, at the policymakers contexts is learning more about, um, uh, you know, what they need and how they need it and, and so on and how Cochrane can be involved. So I hope that answers your question a bit. It's, it's, a, it's a big and important challenge. That's a big question. Thank you for taking a crack at it. Uh, okay. I appreciate it. I would think that we need the, to answer the question, how do we reduce emissions in Canada? But that's uh, come up later. Uh, Vic? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi, uh, thank, thank you, Denise, uh, uh, for a great uh, presentation. Uh, I hadn't known that the Cochrane Group did have a climate health working group, terrific. I was part of the McMaster group that got the mm -hmm. Cochrane collaboration started a few decades ago. Uh, my question is about the map in the 20 countries. Uh, I see that as far as I could tell, South Africa is the only African country there. Mm -hmm. And just for information to you, uh, we have uh, uh, several country partnerships in our CAGH climate change working group. And uh, I think we'd be quite happy to try and make connections between a Nigeria group and a Zambia group, for example. As it happens, there are three of my Nigeria colleagues on this call. So I'm sure Ogo and Christiana, we can pick up this discussion when we have our own uh, meeting tomorrow. But uh, I, put it up, I put it on the table as a specific uh, area where the two working groups can collaborate. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Um, I, I haven't done a lot of recruitment simply because as a volunteer group that for which I do most of the, of the convening, um, I'm, I'm just already experiencing some, some bandwidth issues with the size of the group and the number of projects we have going. So um, it, um, yeah, we're, we're kind of at a tipping point, I guess, of, of needing to, to formalize some of our structures and so on, but that's a separate thing. The short answer is I would, I would love to uh, talk to you guys more and, and, and build some, some connections. Um, the, yeah, the, that's, great. we've got, got lots to share. So thank yeah, you. Great. Thanks. Excellent. That's very important. Uh, Jennifer. Hi there. <laughs> Well, I mean, I was introduced to this group at a very um, timely moment, I suppose. <laughs> I uh, have just undertaken a scoping review on uh, climate change education in undergraduate nursing education. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have a research librarian helping me out and we're just going through the search terms right now and everyone is feeling a bit overwhelmed. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I will like maybe reaching out to you at some point, Denise, to um, learn more about what you've kind of uncovered so far. I do respect that you are very early on in the development of that framework, but if I could pull any little bits of advice from you, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. Um, and uh, I, I did look on the Cochrane website um, because I was recently provided a research appointment with my academic institution and um, wanted to undertake the scoping review. So I was looking for some workshops and whatnot. And unfortunately, I think in the past, couple of years I couldn't find any um, opportunities through Cochrane so I did go through JBI the Joanna Briggs Institute to learn more about systematic reviews and scoping reviews so I'm I'm feeling fortunate to have had that opportunity but also looking to to find some supports um, in the Canadian uh, context too and so I'm not exactly sure. sure how Cochrane and JBI differ either but um or if there is a difference, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, GBI has been more, um, there's a lot of folks are involved in both for sure. Um, okay. and, but, um, but GBI has been more, um, has been focused on nursing specifically. Um, but I, I do have Cochrane colleagues who are also active in GBI. Um, our search filter is in early stages, but I do, I, I could send a couple of, um, search strategies that 
um, uh, have been designed for um, syntheses I've done on climate health topics um, that um, your information specialist might like to have a take a look at. Um, I know one that we did on um, on adaptation options. I was working with with someone with 20 years of experience as a, a health information specialist, and she said it was one of the top three or four most difficult complex searches she'd ever done. Um, so um, yeah, that's like I said, the the reason why our motivation for the search filter. But I'd uh, if having those exemplar searches to work from would be helpful, um, I, I'd be happy to to share those. I appreciate that. And then also too, I mean, I guess from my experience and what can I provide to you uh, from my experience, you know, as I progress or when, when I'm completed so that I can help to further the work that you currently have underway. Yeah, well, why don't we pick up that conversation um, through email or I think sure. hop, hop on a Zoom chat sometime. Yeah, because um, okay. the, you know, I'd love to talk about how the group can be useful to you too. And, and yeah, sort of certainly. back and forth. If there, yeah, if there's room for an additional member and, and what those oh, yeah. time commitments <laughs> might look like, right? I, I don't know exactly how much I could give, but I would be open to having that conversation. And I, I know there's other uh, questions, so I will follow up by email. Great, thanks. Yeah. Where, where where are you based, Jennifer? Oh, sorry, I'm in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Okay, great, good. Okay, Pretty we have a, a, another question before I get my couple in. Uh, Richard, go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks, Denise. That was an excellent summary of the amazing work you've been doing. It's it's really inspiring to see the the depth and range of stuff that this group is, of volunteers have undertaken. Um, I have some generic rambles just to sort of throw in. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I think I want to return to the question of how do we reach decision makers? And I think, I think it's different now to how it was five years ago. Like the net zero targets and this discussion is really coming home to roost. Mm -hmm. Like when we're talking about climate mitigation, this is all gonna happen in the next 10 to 20 years. Like it's now. Um, yeah. So for um, the federal government has said, coming back from uh, COP, that they're gonna, they've committed to sort of like the, the second tier of like healthcare uh, net zero targets. They, they haven't committed us to the healthcare system of being net zero by a date, but they've said we're going to be uh, aiming for um, to have a baseline understanding of our emissions. So at a future COP, presumably in a matter of years, the whole Canadian healthcare system will be signed up to being net zero, which will be a huge transformation. Mm -hmm. um, like each hospital will have to spend millions, tens of millions of dollars to reach these targets. Um, what is, um, so in terms of, the number of decision makers is now much bigger because it's mm -hmm. all executives at hospitals. Right. Um, there is some interesting stuff coming down the pipeline that we can't speak to yet, but there will probably be some um, sort of top down um, encouragement of executives to do sustainable, to reach sustainable uh, goals like reducing the carbon footprint, uh, increasing adaptation and resiliency. Uh, there might be some announcements by that, possibly by Accreditation Canada in the next few months. Um, so, and possibly, um, Jennifer was talking about nurses, like some of those key topics, carbon reduction, uh, adaptation and resiliency, and protecting the environment. Uh, it would be interesting if you're going to be reaching out to your uh, group of nurses, what they think about some of these key topics that uh, uh, are, are going to become more and more sort of at the forefront of decision makers in hospitals. Um, yeah, and I think we're at a really pivotal moment between this balance of doing what has to be done for climate mitigation, but then also planning long term for mm -hmm. adaptation. 
Yeah. And, and that's a problem for us doing systematic reviews because <laughs> we're trying to narrow down the boundary of our questions on those two different areas can yeah. be quite ch challenging and tricky. Yeah, yeah, narrowing it down, but still pre um, pr producing something that's actually useful. Yeah. Mm. Um, Jennifer, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, okay. Jennifer. Are you finished, Richard? Yeah, okay, Jennifer, you had your hand back up. Yeah, and I think I might just want to, you know, add to Richard's conversation there a little bit because recently, you know, when when um, Canada signed on to that agreement uh, with COP uh, twenty six, I believe. Uh, I instantly thought, okay, that's it. It's time to lobby. <laughs> it's time to write letters. And here we mm -hmm. go with some of the nursing advocacy groups. And we were writing letters to the politicians, to MLAs to say, you know, it's time. We need a sustainability um, position in the provincial government. Our, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, city of Winnipeg needs to have a sustainability portfolio that can handle the the requirements of this position and trying to really get it out there. And I mean, it's going to be a snail's pace moving forward. But I think that it takes uh, also to the the ones who have that knowledge and information to then also be advocates and to share that. And that's that knowledge translation piece. Um, to which for me is helpful because I'm still in a teaching position so I can you know spread that to future students and let them do what they want with it right I don't need to do it all myself I feel but um, I do think that we need to share that information with the future who will be taking on some of those leadership roles uh, in the years that come but uh, yeah definitely writing letters and and trying to find um you know, a group of like-minded individuals that are willing to to um, share that information. Yeah, so I'll just throw out um, the Health Canada is releasing tomorrow um, um, a series of chapters of national assessment uh, related to climate change and health called the Health of Canadians in a Changing Climate, um, which is going to be a, a massive, like there's one chapter on adaptation, one chapter on vulnerable populations, et cetera. It's, it's, it's a massive thing that has been several years in the making. So, and they will have a range of KT products, knowledge translation products um, available as well. So um, uh, for those interested in, in the government response and, and having resources to submit law, uh, su support lobbying and so on, um, I anticipate that what's coming out tomorrow will be really helpful. Oh, good. Thank you for that. And certainly, as Richard mentioned about Accreditation Canada, if they get in on the act, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm just going to end with a very one really quick question and then uh, okay. a little bit uh, harder one. You mentioned oh, no. official statistics. What did you mean by official statistics? Are those the national level or but at the global level, would that be WHO or, or what? Um, was that with the um, that uh, project? National yeah, that that is their terminology. So I assume it's the um, their official um, like official government level st stats. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so, so what one way to describe that is um, governments have a have this the uh, onerous task of fairly dividing their resources um, across different regions, and different regions will be affected in to different degrees by climate change so by developing better statistics to forecast what areas will be more impacted you can more equitably distribute the limited resources to for adaptation no oh, very good yeah so clearly okay. richard should be invited to give a an upcoming webinar to this group um, <laughs> good i'm, I'm much better at heckling <laughs> well, no, Richard. Rich, well, Richard's doing some really neat work at his own institution that he's being too modest to talk about. But uh, yeah, good. Well, that's stuff. a good tip. We'll be in touch, Richard. Just uh, <laughs> lastly, you you mentioned about the future looking very different. What, yeah. What's What's your vision of the future? What do you see right now? Oh goodness. Um, <laughs> um, I worry, of course, but um, I feel I, I feel a there is that gathering um, momentum. There's like just as more and more people get involved in the movement um, and governments are feeling increasing pressure. I do feel more optimism that of um, 
that the necessary reductions in you know necessary mitigation steps will be taken. Um, so, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I I talked at the beginning of the presentation my anxieties about my daughter's world, and I still have those for sure. Okay, well, thank you very much. I, I, I wanted to kind of challenge you on that one, but uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard one. I've yeah. been thinking a lot about that lately myself. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, I, I, I just quickly, I gave a presentation last Friday to a class at McGill and I put together in an hour presentation so much information. And by the end of it, I was just devastated at thinking mm -hmm. it all in one spot. Like it was really yeah. overwhelming, everything that's going on. It's Anyways, thank you so yep. very, very much for stimulating <laughs> right. us, for encouraging us, and for providing us with uh, new knowledge too. And hopefully we'll mobilize what we've learned today in our areas. And I thank everybody for coming and stay tuned for another upcoming webinar next month on migration and health and climate change. So thanks everyone. See you again. There'll be a notices coming out.